Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruijt and I'm the host for today's talk. If you're participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation, or you can ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. So today we have a presentation uh, organized by three speakers, Hannah Gibson, Andrew Harvey and Richard Griscom. And the presentation will be given by Andrew Harvey and Richard Griscom today. Um, but I'll introduce all three of them. Um, so I'm going to start with Hannah, who is a senior lecturer in linguistics at the University of Essex, and her research is concerned with linguistic variation, particularly why and how languages change, the syntax and semantics of Bantu languages with a focus on languages spoken in Eastern and Southern Africa. And she has an interest in language and identity, language use in urban contexts, and the relationship between linguistics and social justice. Andrew is a research fellow at the Leiden University Center for Linguistics. The title of his current research is Gorwa Hatsa and Ihanzu, Grammatical Inquiries in the Tanzanian Rift Valley Area. His interests include the languages of the Tanzanian Rift, their documentation and description, their formal morphosyntax, and the histories and cultures of their speaker communities. Uh, and last but not least, we have Richard, who is a postdoc at Leiden University Center for Linguistics. He specializes in the documentation of endangered languages and functional typological linguistic description, with emphasis on the languages of East Africa and the development of digital fieldwork methods. He is currently focusing on the documentation of Hadza, a language isolate of northern Tanzania. Please join me in welcoming Andrew and Richard as they give their talk, Preverbal Clitic Complexes in the Tanzanian Rift Valley Area. Thank you very much, Anna, and thank you everyone for coming. Uh, we're all really excited about this talk uh, because it represents the culmination of many years of work, not just um, from the authors that you see here represented on the screen, but also many other members of the network. So we're very happy to present this research to you today. The Rift Valley area is an area of high linguistic diversity with representatives of the Bantu, Cushitic, and Nilotic language families, as well as Sandawe and Hadza. The seminal work of Kiesling et al. 2008 identified a concentration of preverbal clitic clusters in the Tanzanian Rift Valley area. They noted that preverbal clitic placement is neither a prominent feature of Nilotic nor the Bantu languages of the area, and as such, they considered preferable clitic clusters to represent an aerial feature reflecting the sustained history of language contact in the area. This talk builds on the foundation laid out by Kiesling et al, but expands on this to include a broader range of languages and allows for more detailed discussion and the inclusion of additional data through the development of a paper dedicated to the clitic clusters in the Tanzanian Rift Valley area. The study includes the 12 languages, which you see on the screen. So four languages of the Southern Cushitic family, one language of the Southern Nilotic family, five languages of the Bantu family, and then Sandawe and Hadza. With an improved descriptive status for many of these languages, um, the extension of, of this study to additional languages um, the present study can now contribute even more to our understanding of the geographic and linguistic distribution of preverbal clitic clusters, and then also the status of the Tanzanian Rift Valley area as a whole. So here's a quick roadmap. It's quite straightforward. Uh, we actually just finished the background, and next we'll move into the context of the study, then into the particular analysis of each of the constructions within each language or family. And then we'll end with a summary and some conclusions. Kiesling et al, or KMN, as you'll see uh, it represented throughout the paper, they observed that the preverbal clitic uh, uh, clusters, which have extended the complex through fusion with conjunctions and adpositions, they are characteristic of Southern Cushitic. And as I said, they're not really typical of either Bantu or Nilotic, but there are a number of languages within the Tanzanian Rift Valley area which display incipient preverbal clitic clustering, according to Kiesling et al. The current study uh, will re-examine the position that Kiesling et al. take as a starting point, which is that the South Cushitic preverbal clitic cluster is the prototype 
because it serves as the source of the prevalence or the concentration of the structure in the region. Furthermore, given the additional space that the current study is able to dedicate to this construction in particular, we're able to treat the South Cushitic and Bantu languages included in the study on an individual basis rather than as a whole. Kiesling and all do not propose a series of criteria by which they identify a pre verbal cut cluster, but through the structures that they include, we can observe several properties. The first is syntactic independence, which could be taken to mean that a material may intervene between the clitic cluster and the verb, or that the clitic cluster itself may uh, occur before the verb or after the verb. Also the combination or clustering or fusion of multiple morphemes. And finally, a range of different semantic domains, including subject indexation, object indexation, case tense, clause type, sequentiality, and focus. The Tanzanian Rift Valley area has been the site of extensive sustained contact between many languages of different linguistic stocks for a very long time indeed. The 12 languages of the study sample are represented in the map that you see here. And in this section, we will provide a brief introduction to all the languages and present one or more examples of the relevant structure under analysis. We'll now hand it off to Andrew. <clears throat> so um, we'll start with the uh, Southern Cushitic languages, again, because they've been proposed as sort of prototype for uh, the structure that we will be looking at today. So when we talk about the Southern Cushitic languages, uh, the, we're talking about the languages that are highlighted here in red. Uh, so they're uh, members of the larger Afro-Asiatic phylum. Uh, Alagua has around say, let's say 53,000 speakers. Burungay has around 23,000 speakers. Gorwa has around 133,000 speakers. And Iraq has around 600,000, give or take, speakers. So we sort of range from, from smaller languages to, to rather larger languages in a Tanzanian context. Um, and so uh, we can advance the slide, Richard. Um, so all Southern Cushitic languages employ so they employ a pre-verbal clitic cluster uh, in finite phrases. And so at their core, this pre-verbal clitic complex or cluster can be analyzed as auxiliaries, which are phonologically null if they occur with argument marking, which in addition to our argument marking can host a wide array of clitics, as Richard had mentioned, uh, encoding things like mood, voice, aspect, as well as other concepts such as instrumental arguments ablative, et cetera. And we can advance the slide. Um, and in uh, with the Southern Cushitic languages, we get a, a, a sort of uh, interesting pattern when a direct object intervenes between the pre-verbal clitic cluster and the lexical verb, it is no longer marked as an argument within the clitic cluster. So this phenomenon is sometimes called encapsulation uh, or, uh, and actually fits uh, uh, Marianne Mithun's 1984 description of type three incorporation. And so as can be seen in four below, when the noun do nauda, the house of nauda precedes the clitic cluster, it is marked as a patient argument, ooh. In a similar sentence, uh, as in uh, number, uh, as in number uh, six, uh, when we get the argument do o kutadu, oh, I might have mixed those up. So uh, when we get the kutadu, the house of kutadu occurs between the clitic cluster and the lexical verb. Uh, so in this case, the encapsulated noun phrase is no longer marked on the clitic cluster. The clitic cluster instead shows marking as if it only had a sole argument, that is, as if it were an intransitive verb. So that's a pattern that I'd like to draw our attention to in terms of the Southern Cushitic languages. Um, but also there are key differences uh, between how these Southern Cushitic languages behave, how their pre-verbal clitic complexes behave. So um, for example, if the object is post-verbal in Iraq, it is not marked on the clitic cluster. But for Gorwa, the exact opposite is true. If the object is post-verbal in Gorwa, it is still obligatorily marked in the clitic cluster. So we can see these two examples here. Um, 
where we have uh, where we have um, the obligatory marking of of that um, object, whether it's uh, preverbal or postverbal. There. Um, also, uh, in a logwa, clitic clusters which mark only the arguments may be omitted if the subject is phonologically overt. Uh, so this is another difference. So we can actually um, we can actually omit um, the uh, subject marking uh, or the argument marking if uh, we have a phonologically overt um, argument, which is something that you couldn't do, say, for example, in a language like Gorwa. Also, if the object is postverbal, it is not marked in the clinic complex. So we saw that again with, uh, with Iraq. So we get that patterning, uh, a log one Iraq pattern together um, and Gorwa patterns differently. Um, uh, with regards to Burungay, uh, our fourth uh, language in this, uh, in this uh, family, um, the key differences here include that the most common constituent ordering in Burunga is subject, verb, object. And in this configuration, uh, marking the object in the preverbal clitic complex, again, is optional. So we have Burunga Alagua and Iraq patterning in one way, and we have Gorwa patterning in another way here. So we have some internal variation in what these preverbal clitic clusters can do within Southern Cushitic. Uh, but these are sort of these are sort of the canonical examples uh, that we will show, and sort of everything uh, is is compared sort of to to, to these uh, structures. So um, moving on to the Bantu languages, we can advance the slide now, Richard. Um, the Bantu languages of our sample are Ihamzu, Bugwe, Nyaturu, uh, Nilamba, and Rangi, all of which are considered um, uh, Guthrie F. 30 languages, and of course, this is a geographical um, sort of grouping. Uh, and I think that um, you know we've we've had presentations in the past that have questioned whether these are coherent genetic groupings, uh, probably raising some interesting questions. Um, so we can advance the slide, Richard. So um, with regards to Nyaturu, preverbal clitics do not occur in every clause in Nyaturu but are used to express certain tense aspect uh, combinations. So for example, sequential, persistive, near and far past, and near and far future, as well as for subordinate clauses. And so when these tense aspect clause types are expressed together, the preverbal clitics occur in what would be identified as a preverbal clitic cluster in this language. So this is exemplified in C where subordination and uh, far past are marked within the clitic cluster. So we see this double marking occurring together. Um, I'll give us a second or two just to take that in because I know that we're, we're running through a lot of data right now. I'll give, uh, give you guys a couple seconds just to look at these patterns here. But not too long, let's, uh, let's advance the slide, Richard. So like I said, when, when these notions are, 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 are expressed together, we can posit that the resulting string are preverbal clitic clusters uh, in these Bantu languages. So phonologically, these preverbal clitic co complexes can bear tone. Uh, and syntactically, uh, and unlike Nyatur, the material cannot intervene between the clitic complexes and the lexical verb. So this is an example of Ihanzu. And so we see that it's a little bit different uh, from Nyaturu. Uh, so in Yatura, we can actually get material intervening between that preverbal clitic complex. So we can have like a subject in Yaturu, but um, in Ihanzu, we can't get that. We can't actually have a subject intervening between um, our bolded preverbal clitic complex here and the lexical verb. So that doesn't happen. We get a little bit of variety. So if we advance the slide uh, once more, Richard. Um, for discussion of preverbal clitics in Ragyambugwe, the relative construction or the relevant construction has been described as a complex auxiliary based construction. And these are used to en encode sort of a variety of tense aspect mood distinctions with the specific tense aspect combinations also showing variation between uh, Mbugwe and Rangi. So in table form here, um, we have, uh, so Richard, we can advance the slide. Um, we have sort of, we have sort of the slots uh, can be seen as uh, follows. So in Yilamba and Ihanzu, we have uh, we have negation and tense are sort of considered part of the um, preverbal clitic cluster. With Nyaturu, it's a bit more um, uh, complex. Uh, first, in that we actually have more slots, 
but as well, um, some of these uh, some of these aspect or clause combining uh, auxiliaries can actually be marked uh, for uh, argument or for subject agreement. So we can see that in uh, in this uh, in the dashed line there uh, under Nyaturu there we get this uh, we get this optional um, uh, subject marking, which is quite interesting. So we'll get actually the um, this auxiliary will be, will be marked, and so too will the um, will the lexical verb, and it will be marked in a different way with a different uh, paradigm of markers. So I think that that's quite interesting. Whereas in Yulamba and Ihanzu and Rangi and Bugwe, we don't get that. Um, so Richard, we can advance the slide, uh, and I'll uh, and I'll mute myself, and I'll let you uh, do the Datoga talking. Great, thanks. So now we'll move on to Datoga. Datoga is a dialect cluster or a group of closely related languages belonging to the Southern Nilotic family. The Datoga varieties, which include Asamjig, Barabaiga, Bianjida, Gisamjanga, and others, are spoken primarily in Northern and Central Tanzania. And the total number of Datoga speakers has been estimated to be around 87,800, uh, but I actually personally expect it to be uh, more than that, perhaps over than 100,000. Mutual intelligibility between varieties varies. The Datoga varieties in our sample are Asamjig and Gisamjanga, and they're primarily treated together. So I'll give you some context now to situate our discussion of the constructions which have been described as preverbal critic clusters by Kiesling et al. And to do this, I'll just uh, run through a, a quick description of the structure of verbs in Datoga. So here you can see um, a templatic representation of the Datoga verb. This is based on my own analysis of the Asim Jake variety. Uh, but it's quite similar to other analyses for different Datoga varieties. So you'll see that we have three prefix slots, one of which is required, and then we have four optional suffix slots after the root. Today, we'll mostly be focusing on the prefixes. The first slot uh, includes the conditional. The second slot has the affirmative and the negative, so two polarity categories but then also a temporal construction. And then the third slot is subject annexation. And as I said, this slot is required. Following that, we have the root. And as I said, we won't worry about the suffixes today. One interesting thing we find in Datoga, this is true for all of the varieties, is that there's a, a special structure, which I've called in my dissertation the dependent stem structure or construction. And that consists of the root together with a special subject indexation paradigm, and then all of these suffix slots, which are optional. And this, this structure, it occurs within a range of different types of constructions. The first type is that it occurs independently as uh, an imperative construction or a cohortative construction. Uh, but the constructions we're most interested in today uh, are constructions in which the dependent stem combines together with other verbal morphology preceding the dependent stem. So those include the future construction and then what I call in my dissertation bound auxiliary constructions. These are the constructions which were considered by Kiesling et al to be representative of the category preverbal clitic cluster. Uh, the dependent stem is also present in some multiverbal constructions. Well, let's take a look now at uh, examples of the future and the so-called bound auxiliary constructions. So this is the structure of these constructions. So you see it's very similar to what I call the simplex verbal constructions. You have the conditional in the first slot, and then you have the affirmative in the next slot, but then you'll see slots three and four are new. The first is the future, and then the, the next one is the bound auxiliary slot, which uh, consists of either the persistive, ad, or the priority, goal. And subject, subject indexation, as I said, it follows a special paradigm specific to the dependent stem structure, and it is obligatory.
here's just one example uh, to show you uh, how some of the slots in, in this templatic uh, format uh, are represented in an actual verb. So here, uh, example come, I'm sending you to Mongola. Uh, here we're focusing on the verb at the end of this, this clause. And you'll see that the affirmative, the future, and the uh, first person singular subject indexation are represented here as prefixes in the verb. Kiesling et al. have proposed that the future may consist of a, or may constitute a clinic, and they provide a couple of pieces of evidence for that. The first piece of evidence is uh, from some recordings of Kisam Janga taken from the Burger Corpus from the 1930s. And this is analyzed as a future relative construction. So in this example, you see the word ja, uh, class as future relative. Uh, this is present in other varieties of De Toga as well. Um, in my own dissertation, I, I gave a slightly different analysis, which was not a future relative, but rather just a uh, relative construction. The second construction, which uh, Kiesling et al. cite in support of the analysis of the future construction as a clitic, is a construction also found in the Berger corpus. And this is one in which the future is separated from the lexical verb by the subject argument. So you can see that here in example 17, uh, the future co-occurring with the sequential prefix uh, separated from the verb call by the subject MP, every person. Unlike the relative construction, this separated future construction has not been seen in other Datoga data, um, but it, it does more closely resemble the uh, standard uh, future construction uh, because it has a sequential prefix on it uh, and it appears to be functioning as the future would in a, in a standard clause. So this is closer to typical Datoga data, but still distinct from um, what has been observed elsewhere. Now we'll move on to Sandawe. Sandawe is a language of central Tanzania, which is typically classified as either Khoisan, meaning related to uh, other click languages of Southern Africa, um, specifically the Koikwadi family, uh, or unclassified. Sandawe is spoken by approximately 40,000 people and has two mutually intelligible varieties, Eastern Sandawe and Western Sandawe. In Sandawe, the person, gender, and number of the subject in realis clauses is coded through verbal enclitics and or preverbal clitics that attach to other clause constituents. The PGN clitics can attach to non-subject clause constituents such as objects and adverbs in addition to or rather than the verb. So you see that in the example here uh, where the adjective uh, big and the noun baboon uh, both have a PGN clitic attached to the end. In realis negative and irrealis clauses, there are additional paradigms of verbal suffixes, which are distinct from those that are used in the PGN clitic paradigm. And these do not function as clitics. They are purely verbal suffixes. So you can see those represented in the table here. The subject NP or pronominal in a realis clause is also optionally marked with a subject focus or SF marker. Generally, a verb without a PGN clinic cannot proceed the first PGN clinic or subject focus marker of a clause. And a verb with a PGN clinic cannot be preceded by another PGN clinic or SF marker in the same clause. Now that, that's a bit confusing but suffice it to say that there's a direct relationship between the distribution of PGN codex and uh, subject focus markers. Uh, furthermore, it's possible that the subject focus marker and the PGN codex paradigm may have developed from the same diachronic source as their formal similarities between the SF marker and the third person PGN codex. 
So if you see the subject focus marker here, ah, uh, when we go back, you'll see that third person plural is ah, uh, third person masculine singular is ah, uh, and third person feminine singular is sa. Uh. So it's possible that the subject focus marker in the PGN codec paradigm developed from the same source because of these formal similarities, but also because they share semantic and pragmatic properties. So they're uh, related to the subject argument, uh, but also their distribution is conditioned by information structure and their distribution is mutually exclusive. So all this evidence points to the possibility that they might have developed together from the same uh, set of subject pronouns. And now moving. we'll, oh, thank you. yeah, welcome back, Andrew. Thank you. Uh, moving now to uh, Hadza. Uh, Hadza is a language isolate uh, spoken in the Lake Eosi Basin of Northern Tanzania by around probably a thousand people, according to uh, Edenmeyer and Blurton Jones. Though Richard and I uh, have a feeling that it's probably a bit more than that, maybe closer to 2,000 or more. Um, previously thought to be a Khoisan language, again, as we saw with, uh, with Sundawe, related in some way or the other to the click languages of Sundawe. Um, Sands' uh, 1995 work establishes Hadza as a language isolate. And we can advance the slide, Richard. Um, so in all non-imperative verbal predicate clauses in Hadza, the person, gender, number of the subject argument is obligatorily coded together with the tense and aspect of the clause. So each paradigm may occur either as verbal enclitics, as in example number 20, preverbal clitics that attach to an auxiliary or adverb, as in 21, or as a pre-verbal syntactically independent constituent as in 22. So again, we see a little bit sort of different uh, syntactic behavior here. So these uh, person, gender, number, tense, aspect, mood, morphs occur in four sets of fusional paradigms uh, identified by uh, in Miller 2016 as anterior and anterior would be representing non-past or recent past tense, posterior, past or remote past tense, potential, something said with some certainty and or non-past tense, and veridical, so something said with less certainty and or counterfactual. We can advance the slide. So we've talked about, um, we've talked about um, sort of the, uh, in very brief, of course, because there's a lot of languages we're working with, but we've given sort of some examples of what the structures we're going to be looking at look like and also the kinds of things that they can encode and some of some of their um sort of syntactic um sort of the syntactic patterns uh, that we've noticed are interesting um and so now what we'd like to do is we'd like to sort of talk about uh, what our analysis is so um so came in 2008 came out with one analysis and now we would like to um sort of review uh these analyses of, of, of how these forms uh, came about. And uh, we'd like to uh, take into account uh, new data and uh, new analyses and uh, provide, um, provide sort of a, a second picture or a second look at these. And that's what we'd like to do now. We'd like to look at sort of these contact stories and see, uh, and see what, we, what we came up with. So we can advance the slide now. Uh, yes, so basically what we want to do now is we want to sort of say, okay, where did these things come from? So in light of the examples, what we've presented, let's, uh, let's look at some, uh, let's look at these uh, preverbal clitic complexes and see, uh, and see what their possible sources may be. Uh, so we can advance the slide, Richard. So this is, um, this is uh, a quick, uh, a quick um, uh, rundown of uh, the uh, preverbal clitic complexes and uh, what uh, the historical explanation had been sort of explained or had been sort of set up to be in KMN 2008. So we see that with the uh, Cushitic forms, uh, they were sort of largely explained as a retention from Cushitic. Uh, and that, um, for example, Sandawe was chance, etc. So now what we'd like to do is we'd like to sort of revisit these stories, revisit this data, 
and uh, and and look at some new stuff and see uh, and see if that um, holds up or if we have if we can provide sort of uh, alternate descriptions and alternate explanations as well. So let's start with um, the story of uh, Nyaturu. So um, in terms of in terms of Nyaturu, the, uh, the 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 origin story was that a lot of this material uh, came into Nyaturu through diffusion. From South Cushitic, which would be uh, West Rift, the language would have been proto language West Rift at the time, and uh, and the description is such that um, the justification for this is that the forms uh, Na and Na and Iqui have no identifiable Bantu source, uh, and so the forms uh, the forms Na and Na were probably from West Rift Cushitic, and uh, the source for the form Iqui was unknown, and then there were um, uh, functional similarities as well. So these were all used as markers of subordination, tense, and sequentiality. And that's very similar to South Cushitic. Um, so the socio-historical context, the description was that ancestors of Nyaturu speakers, speaking a language more like contemporary Sukuma or Nyamwezi, moved into a West Rift speaking area and interacted over hundreds of years. And this innovation produced uh, either by speakers of West Rift bilingual in pre Nyaturu or by speakers of pre Nyaturu bilingual in West Rift. And so the plausible grammaticalization pathways are that um, for the sequential and persistive verb internal inflectional morpheme became a pre verbal auxiliary. And for tense aspect, what we see is uh, borrowing. Relative um, was a question mark. So um, we'll advance the slide and we'll go towards a, a current analysis. So what we see here is we see the current, uh, we see the current Nyaturu, uh, or we see the current Nyaturu uh, template. So this is given in a templatic form. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight these forms that are spoken about in 2008. I'm going to talk about where they, where they might've come from. So we can advance the slide. And uh, the first uh, form that we are going to look at here is uh, the subordinate knee. And uh, the subordinate knee, we can, uh, yes, uh, we can probably say is, it has its source as a Bantu focus marker. In, um, in Southern Cushitic, uh, uh, there is a knee marker for uh, relative, but it seems like uh, that knee marker is, uh, is, a Cushitic, uh, is a Cushitic holdover. But it seems like, it seems like it's very plausible that this subordinate came from a focus marker in, uh, in Bantu languages. It seems to be, uh, seems to be uh, convincing. Um, so if we advance the slide, uh, Richard, once more, uh, we can see this uh, form uh, Aja in uh, Nyaturu, and we can compare that to uh, a form uh, that also encodes past in Ihanzu, so this Adza form. So again, we, we see that this particular tense form uh, probably has a plausible um, uh, probably has a plausible um, origin uh, in, uh, in Bantu. Uh, and uh, if we are, if we advance the slide once more, uh, we have the uh, sequential form ka. So if we, if we recall, this was, or sorry, I should say the, the sequential form ka, uh, which is actually a, uh, it's actually a, um, a, a uvular, uh, sound, so a ra sound. It's written with ka, which can be a bit confusing uh, because we have other languages in the area which use this q as an ejective uh, uh, uvular sound, ka. Um, but what we can see is that Masele um, uh, posits that, that a ga sound uh, could have become a ra sound uh, historically in the languages of the area. Um, now, Sukuma doesn't have a ga uh, morpheme that we can tie to this, but it does have a ka morpheme. Uh, that indicates circumstantial, non-definitive, or unaccomplished. And this is in Batibu's, Batibo's 1985 work of uh, Sukuma. So again, maybe we can posit that this ka and uh, the nyaturu ka are uh, somehow uh, related. Um, but that's, you know, that's one possible Bantu internal um, uh, uh, description or story that we can tell. And we can advance the uh, slide, Richard. Uh, similarly, uh, this form uh, ke in uh, nyaturu is uh, is used for persistive. Uh, in ihanzu, uh, we have a form kere, which is an auxiliary form meaning still. Now it doesn't pattern in the exact same way 
Um, but that could very well be and be some sort of origin. We'd need to we'd need to look at if this was uh, originally some sort of lexical verb uh, in the Bantu languages of the area. But I think that this is an interesting um, this is an interesting in uh, for what this persistive might actually be here. Uh, and we can advance the slide uh, once again, Richard. So in terms of these na uh, far past and uh, near future morphemes. Uh, we can see again that 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 these are um, pretty uncontroversially. We can see uh, similar forms in uh, in uh, Proto West Rift or in the current uh, South Cushitic languages of the area. So we see that in Yaturu we have a far past uh, morpheme uh, na, and uh, we can see that we have a and Burungay has a for for general past and preterite, and we have a somewhat similar form in Iraq Gorwa perfected ga or a. Uh. So that seems like it's uh, it's pretty uncontroversial. The KMN analysis seems like it's, it makes a lot of sense here. And uh, we can advance the slide. And uh, yes, and uh, this na, uh, okay, I think that that's actually, but actually there, there's also a, 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 a morpheme uh, from Sukuma, uh, an a uh, morpheme that uh, indicates accomplishment or immediative. Uh, so again, this could possibly be an internal Bantu uh, source for this uh, tense morpheme. Of course, Sukuma has a short vowel. This is a long vowel. So that's something that we need to look at as well. Um, so we can advance the slide, uh, Richard. Um, yes, to, yes, to the uh, near future uh, slide. So uh, again, we see that Burunge has a long a, uh, and that's uh, and that's glossed as a future one, and it seems to correspond quite closely with the uh, near future uh, tense uh, morpheme here in Yaturu. So again, that seems like it's uh, it's quite um, it's quite uh, uncontroversial and perhaps the least controversial um, source uh, description. So we can advance the slide again, uh, Richard. Um, in terms of the equi, it had been noted that there were that there was no um, convincing uh, source for equi, and happily we found some interesting uh, stuff, uh, not in the standardized sukuma that's described uh, in Batibo, but actually in uh, the Jinyakeya sukuma, which is geographically closer to uh, the area in which uh, Nyaturu is spoken currently. So Jinyakeya sukuma has a form guema, which means to stand. And also Rangi has a, a verb, uh, quima, which is to stand. And it seems uh, like for a far future, this equi, I mean, it seems like it could be a plausible grammaticalization pathway to have a form to stand uh, become something in the uh, far future. So uh, that's sort of an interesting source for that, um, for that mysterious morpheme. Uh, so we can talk about that uh, later if you'd like. So um, our uh, current analysis um, that we'd like to provide is uh, that the form equi has an identifiable source as a lexical verb for to stand in nearby Bantu languages, and the sequential kha and the persistive k also have plausible Bantu internal origins. Now, um, in terms of what that means, in terms of the socio-historical context, we can have a discussion about that. Uh, but uh, right now, I'll mute and I'll leave uh, the next section to Richard. All right, thanks. Now we come back to Datoga, and uh, I'll give away our conclusion here at the end, um, which is that uh, our current analysis is that the constructions considered by Kiesling et al. to be pre-verbal critic clusters um, borrowed through uh, historical contact between Datoga speakers and Iraq communities uh, are actually, in fact, uh, inherited or due to retention. And I'll, I'll walk you through uh, that argumentation. Uh, there are two general issues with the analysis um, presented by Kiesling et al. Uh, first is that there's evidence of cognate constructions for the Datoga persistive and the sequential in other Southern Nilotic languages. And there's a similar but not cognate future construction involving a, uh, a word meaning want, uh, which is actually a, a cognate of a word in Datoga, although that word is not used for the future in Datoga. The second general issue, though, is that there's a plausible grammaticalization path uh, which does not require contact. And it's reflected in multiverbal constructions of other Southern Nilotic languages. 
So first, let's look at the cognates. So as I said, for the future, there is no cognate construction in the other Southern Nilotic languages, uh, but there are similar constructions that involve a, a word uh, match or match, meaning uh, want. And that's a well-established grammaticalization pathway, the, the verb meaning want uh, becoming a future construction. So here I just have a small sample of Southern Nilotic languages, including Nandi, Charangain, and Akie. And we see evidence of that in uh, Nandi and Akie, so the future construction, uh, which is somewhat parallel to the Datoga future construction, but not exactly the same. For the persistive and the sequential, however, uh, Kisung et al. didn't provide examples of these, but they mentioned them in the prose. Uh, but uh, here we do actually have clear examples of cognate constructions in Southern Nilotic languages. So for the persistive, which in Datoga, uh, for Barabaik and Kisamjanga, it has been described as Udu or Gudu. Uh, for uh, Atsumjig Datoga, it's Ad. Uh, so in Nandi, we have Ta, Charangain, we have Ta, and Ake, we have Ta. And in Ake, it's actually analyzed uh, by um, Heine and Koenig and Leger as uh, constituting an auxiliary. The sequential uh, is a little bit different in that we don't have uh, we don't have an exact cognate construction. Well, we have a cognate construction, but it, the function is different. So the sequential in uh, Barabaig or Gisamjanga de Toga is uh, ag or ak. Uh, in Asamjig de Toga, it's uh, purely tonal. So, uh, it's a high tone on the, uh, the first syllable of the verb. And we find in other Southern Nilotic languages, not a sequential construction necessarily, uh, but a coordinating conjunction, ak, which means and or with. And in the example of uh, Charangain, um, it's actually analyzed as a clinic. Uh, Kiesling 2019, which is actually a presentation from the Rift Valley Network webinar series, proposes an alternative potential source for Kisamjanga de Toga complex sem constructions, such as uh, the uh, future or the persistive. Under this analysis, Kiesling suggests that the de Toga constructions developed out of multiverbal clauses and were simply inherited rather than borrowed or created as a result of contact. One key feature of Datoga verbs, which supports the putative verbal origins of the complex stem constructions is the affirmative prefix. So that's the ga or ka prefix. Within the subject indexation paradigm of the complex stem constructions. So again, those are constructions that include the dependent stem with that special uh, subject indexation paradigm. Within that paradigm, third person subject indexation mandatorily co-occurs with a form that is identical to the preverbal, sorry, the affirmative prefix. So you can see that in the example here. Um, so if you have your money, he will give it to you. In that last uh, verb, he will give it to you. We have what I've analyzed as two instances of the affirmative prefix, but uh, sometimes analyzed by others as uh, an affirmative prefix and then uh, subject in indexation, which happens to include a voice view or stop within it. Uh, Anderson, 2006, writes that the doubling pattern displayed by this data that we see here, uh, whereby the uh, polarity prefix is repeated twice, um, this supports the claim that construction is developed out of a multiverbal historical source. The development of the doubling pattern could be described as having occurred in three stages. You can see that in this table. In the first stage, the two full inflected verbs co-occur in a multiverbal biclausal construction. In the second stage, the first verb grammaticalizes and in the process loses the capacity to co-occur with standard inflectional suffixes and a full subject indexation paradigm. The diachronic development of the second verb is perhaps less transparent uh, because it's tied to the wider distribution of the dependent stem structure in imperative and subordinate clause constructions. Um, but it is clear that the second verb loses its capacity to co-occur with the affirmative prefix for non-third person subjects. 
In the third and final stage, the first verb becomes syntactically bound to the second verb and constitutes a cluster of preverbal morphology. Kiesling 2019 proposes that a potential historical source for complex sem constructions um, consists of a verbal auxiliary followed by a lexical verb corresponding to stage two of the diachronic pathway, which I'm presenting here. The co-occurrence of the future and what I call the bound auxiliaries uh, could be due to the merger of multiple verbs through the same pathway. So you could have uh, what was once a future auxiliary and then other as aspect auxiliaries and then a lexical verb at the end, and then they all get connected together. And there are some examples from the 1930s Burger Corpus indicate that the future may have been more syntactically independent in the past. There's also evidence uh, from Asam Jig to Toga that the persistive may function independently as a verb. So in conclusion, uh, our analysis is that the structures present in Toga are most likely inherited or due to retention, uh, because in each case there's evidence of cognate or similar constructions in other Southern Nilotic languages, and there's evidence of a plausible internal grammaticalization pathway. Now we will continue to Sandawe. So Kisung et al. proposed that any similarities between Sandawe, PGN codecs, and the codec constructions of the other Tanzanian Rafale area languages are most likely due to chance. And we find this claim to be supported by a number of pieces of evidence. Uh, first, there are no morphemes in the Sandawe PGN codec paradigm, which can be linked to any other language in the Tanzanian Rafale area. Uh, second, the Sandawe PGN codecs are monomorphemic which makes them distinct from the clusters of codecs that we've seen in uh, especially the Southern or South Cushitic languages. And finally, uh, they're not restricted to the preferable position like South, uh, South Cushitic clusters. So in, in summary, the Sandawi PGN codecs uh, lack many of the hallmark features of the South Cushitic codec clusters and do not appear to bear resemblance to constructions from any neighboring language. Uh, if the PGN codec paradigm is in fact an inherited construction, then we may find evidence of cognate constructions in the languages of the Koikwadi family, if Sandawe happens to be related to Koikwadi. Um, and I did a quick search and I did find some evidence of that uh, in Tsiha. Um, so this is from a grammar written uh, by Fenn in 2014. And she states that uh, the PGN codecs of Tsika are not obligatory uh, and they can distinguish uh, specific uh, from non-specific nominal reference. So it's not quite the same pragmatic function as the PGN codecs uh, in Sandawe, but uh, still within the same semantic and pragmatic domain. And now uh, we can move to Hadza, which is kind of exciting because at the time, uh, Kiesling Mouse and Nurse's 2008 work notes that basically for Hadza, there wasn't enough data to say anything, uh, anything, anything historically meaningful. Happily, and thanks to the work of people like Bonnie Sands, Kirk Miller, as, as well as much more recently, Richard and I, this is something which now can be undertaken. So, uh, and we can advance the slide, Richard. So for this, we'll look at two aspects of the Hadza preverbal clitic complex complex is the subject indexation, we can advance the slide, and uh, the auxiliaries, which, in, which code concepts, including tense aspect mood, and we can see them uh, uh, bolded here. So we can advance the slide. Starting with the auxiliaries shown here, um, both, and we can, yeah, both sequentials, ha and ka, are actually good candidates for cognates with the ka sequentials seen elsewhere in our sample. So uh, for example, we have that Nyaturu Pra, for example, uh, and the other Bantu form, say for example, in Sukuma. Um, so we can advance the slide uh, again. Um, and, uh, and so we can take a, so moving from the auxiliaries, uh, we can take a look at the subject indexation now, which codes person, gender, and number, but also concepts including tense and mood. So there are five paradigms for subject indexation, one of the most common of which can be seen here, um, of course, for the anterior uh, tense. Um, so um, this one is perhaps actually the least immediately 
helpful when looking for patterns as it's rather irregular. Um, so looking at the others, uh, I've, had, I've done them as four different uh, paradigms here on this, uh, on this page. We can actually see some enticing patterns emerge. So we can advance the slide, Richard. Firstly, we have this equiveridical uh, tense for, for less certainty or counterfactual. So the suffix highlighted here, and we can advance the slide, is highly similar to the nyaturu equi far future auxiliary. And we can advance the slide again. So compare the Jinyakiya Guima stand and the Rangi Quima stand. Again, these are Bantu lexical, uh, lexical verbs, but we can see that in Yaturu, it's been used as far uh, future. So, I mean, that seems to make uh, a fair bit of sense for veridical when we're talking about something with a little bit less certainty. Um, so I think, that that's, I think that that's interesting. It's an interesting sort of um, formal and possible, possibly functional uh, similarity there. So we can advance the slide, Richard. Second, the morpheme common to the posterior paradigm, that is the one indicating past or remote past, and we can advance the slide again. Uh, the double a ah here, and it's pronounced as a ah, ah. Uh, when you write a double vowel in uh, Hadza, it means that there's a glottal stop between it. So this would be uh, the first person singular would be something like na a. Ah. Uh, the first person plural exclusive would be something like a ah, a. Ah. Um, we can advance the slide. It could possibly be related to the long ah suffix associated with the past in Proto-West Rift. Uh, we can advance the slide again, Richard. Uh, this isn't for sure though, because again, as I've mentioned, as the Hadza morpheme as written represents two vowels, ah, separated by a glottal stop, ah, ah, whereas all the forms to the right represent a single long ah, ah. So our, the work that we need to do now is we need to be able to prove, or we need to be able to show that you know, uh, Hadza will will break up these long vowel sequences uh, with a glottal stop. I think uh, I think that there may be evidence for that, but we need to look a little bit harder. I think and before uh, before we cash in uh, all of our chips on that, uh, so we can advance the slide. Finally, um, and uh, throughout virtually all of the Hadza subject indexation paradigms. So again, these paradigms here, we can advance the slide. Um, interestingly, first person is always, almost always encoded with an N. Um, we can advance the slide. Um, and second person is always encoded uh, with a T and uh, we can advance the slide. And third person is almost always encoded with S. Uh, so I find this uh, immediately interesting. So if we look at, uh, we can advance the slide. Uh, if we look at the Hadza subject ind indexation, uh, it's indicated first person is N, second person is T, and third person is S. We can advance the slide again. This actually lines up exactly with uh, common Afroasiatic pronouns. So if we see, for example, a mazik, we see uh, uh, we can see uh, reconstructed chadik, and we can see reconstructed uh, kushitic. We can see that these um, that these uh, morphemes N, T, and S are repeated uh, almost uh, everywhere. Um, across this very widespread uh, area where Afroasiatic is spoken uh, pretty consistently. So that's kind of interesting. So we can advance the slide again, Richard. Of course, with that said, and we can advance the slide again, uh, if we reconstruct uh, Southern Cushitic, uh, no second person T form nor a third person S form has been reconstructed for Proto-West Rift which would otherwise be the most likely donor of any Afroasiatic pronouns to Hadza. So this is immediately an interesting question. If Hadza got, the, got these, uh, got these uh, NTS morphemes from Afroasiatic, and if Proto-West Rift Cushitic doesn't have them, well, where the heck did they come from? Um, so we can advance the slide. Now, I've uh, suggested in an earlier talk given here at the uh, Rift Valley Network webinar series, that the current verbal inflection, so not pronouns in, in any way, but the verbal inflection forms for Gorwa and Iraq is the result of a historically present T morpheme. So, um, so you, can, uh, you can perhaps associate T with second person uh, in, this, uh, in this way. Um, and also if we uh, advance the slide, the current uh, Gorwa and Iraq third person pronoun does feature an S. So I wonder if that, um, if that forces us to think a little bit more about what this third person reconstruction could possibly be, or if this was somehow the result of contact with another uh, Cushitic language that was spoken in the area and has um, subsequently left no trace. So I think that's an interesting uh, question. 
so we can uh, we can uh, we can forward the slide. Um, we can advance the slide. So at the same at the same time, the question remains. So if the subject indexation forms in Hadza are of Afroasiatic origin, and if the origin is specifically from Afroasiatic pronouns, is Proto West Rift or even uh, its predecessor language a plausible donor for these forms, or was it from another Cushitic or Afroasiatic language entirely? Um, so we can advance the slide again. Uh, returning finally to our paradigm, so we can advance the slide again, there's another interesting pattern, the final pattern we'll talk about, to take into account. That being that while the subject indexation morphology for first and second person is presented to the left of the tense aspect mood morphology here, we can advance the slide, Richard. The subject indexation morphology for third person is present to the right of the tense aspect mood morphology. So we have a different behavior um, for first and second person uh, subject indexation and uh, third person subject in indexation. So we can advance the slide again. This could be taken as, uh, this could be analyzed in sort of two ways. Uh, so we could say that this is evidence for the possibility that Hadza may previously have had verb auxiliary word order with the tense aspect mood morphemes coming from verbal auxiliaries and two distinct post-verbal word order patterns for first, second person, and third person subjects. Alternatively, it could mean that the subject indexation morphemes were developed at two different times. Maybe, for example, third person was unmarked or something, and therefore ended up affixing to different parts of the clitic cluster because of this diachronic difference. So if we advance the slide, um, we can see that um, our sort of current analysis uh, for Hadza, where there was uh, no, uh, no uh, uh, earlier analysis, was that the auxiliaries ha and ka, sequential, they resemble Bantu forms. And the equi for veridical, uh, that tense aspect mood marker, resembles Bantu forms stand or maybe the Nyaturu far future. The a a posterior uh, tense aspect mood marker resembles proto West rift form for past, that long a, but we need to do a little bit more homework there. Um, subject indexation morphemes, N for first person, T for second person, and uh, S for third person, resemble forms from Afroasiatic, but not necessarily for, from proto rest rift. Uh, and now we can advance finally to Rangim Bugwe. And uh, essentially, um, the existing analysis um, uh, was that um, these were forms of Bantu origin, and there's no real reason to suggest that the forms themselves represent any kind of borrowing that are the result of context, contact. And uh, so the current analysis that we provide uh, based on uh, past work by uh, Hannah Gibson, for example, and uh, Vera Wilhelmsen is that this seems to be an independent innovation, although perhaps facilitated by the history of contact in the area. So we can look at uh, Hannah Gibson and Lutz Martin's work in 2019, for example. Uh, so we can advance the slide. And I'm not going to bel belabor the, the summary and conclusions. I'd really like for us to, uh, to have some discussion. I know that we filled up a lot of our time. Um, so uh, if we advance the slide, um, so if we look at sort of the case of the preverbal clitic cluster as an aerial feature, we know that there are sort of few common form meaning pairs in the clitics of the Rift Valley area. And then sort of the larger question would be, what would it mean to borrow clitic cluster as a grammatical feature? What does that mean sort of in a historical and in sort of a syntactic sense? So we can advance the slide. And then uh, I guess that reflects uh, sort of assessing the Rift Valley area as an area. And we know that there are gaps in the data and uh, you know what does that and, and also what what does what does the concept of a linguistic area mean? So is is it a collection of features un uniformly distributed through a geographical area at roughly the same time, or um, is it an area where the geographical and temporal distribution of multiple linguistic features overlap? The second probably being more complex, or perhaps um, more uh, illustrative of of the feature that we're looking at right now. Uh, and we can advance the slide and talk about next steps. Um, obviously, additional data for individual languages, but also um, individual language varieties. I, I, you know, I mean, I think that we can see that this um, this uh, sort of uh, smaller variety of Sukuma, this Jinyakia, which which uh, is different from uh, other varieties of Sukuma, we saw that it was very useful for our um, for our descriptions and for our historical explanations. So additional data from, from these smaller varieties, we can see that the cover term Nyaturu or Nyilamba may actually be hiding um, other varieties that could, that could yield very interesting data. Um, and uh, we, there are other languages to include. So for example, we were sad that um, basically 
uh, in uh, Kiesling Mouse and Nurse 2008, uh, they talked about um, uh, they talked about um, uh, Kimbu uh, with some data, and unfortunately, the descriptive um, uh, status of Kimbu is really only just now sort of opening up with with the work of our colleague uh, Augustino Amos Caguema. Uh, so again, uh, there are other languages to include, and also you know we probably need to go back and and, and look a little bit more at the socio historical and contact context, and of course. Uh, uh, the, you know, uh, all the features that are proposed in, uh, in Kiesling Mouse and Nurse's uh, really sort of landmark work in 2008, they're all worth looking at and examining in this way as well. And hopefully this uh, opens up future work for, um, for all of our members uh, as well. So we can advance the slide. And uh, thanks very much. I know this was a long talk. There was a lot to get through, but I hope that we can sort of hang around after our uh, designated time and uh, chat about this a little bit. So thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew and Richard, for a really interesting presentation. Um, yeah, we can move straight on to the question and answer section. So um, if you want to ask a question, please raise your hands using the nonverbal controls or write your question in the chat. Uh, and please remember that uh, the webinars are being recorded. So if you do ask a question, this will be part of the recording and will be released on the YouTube channel. Um, let me see if I can see any hands. Um, Bonnie. Hi, thanks for the talk. It, it's clearly a lot of work that you put into that. Uh, for people who may not be familiar, I just want to point out that uh, Archie Tucker actually also noticed these uh, phenomenal similarities with Hadza and Afroasiatic in a number of publications. So I was going to just share some of those. I think there's even another uh, with you. Uh, I was quite interested in the equi forms. And I think that's a great example of how doing more dialect work is uh, really an important window into history. So I was checking the world lexicon of grammaticalization and, and stand can result in durative's or progressives, but they didn't have any examples in that book of it turning into a future. So what I was wondering is, the standing up, if you're standing up and going somewhere, that definitely seems more like a future kind of activity than standing like as, as a duration kind of way. So uh, that's just a suggestion if in those Bantu languages you might find that the way that that particular stand verb is used tends to be I'm standing up and about to do something. Because in a way that's almost like a, the kind of fine grained approach that a dialect work gives you. It's like showing how the word is used, not the gloss, but how it's actually normally used. It's like the phonetics <laughs> of, the, of the lexical semantics might give you a, a better clue as to where, how it might change, how it might grammaticalize. And then, uh, sorry, to, I don't, I'm not trying to take all the time here, but Hadza has a verb, ika, to stop. And stop and stand often sort of have some overlap. Now that's not the most characteristic kind of uh, root structure for a Hadza word, but just just remember that Hadza word and try to fit that in your explanation somewhere. Richard, did you want to respond? I have a couple ideas. No, go, I, go ahead. I I just add, yeah, I think all of this is really useful. I didn't know that the Tucker stuff had that um, pronoun. Uh, had that pronoun noted, and I'll, I'll give it a read and uh, and look. That's really useful, Bonnie. Well, they had he had the n and the 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 t, but not the s. I think. Oh, okay, cool. All right, that's interesting. Um, and also like this this sort of appeal to dialect work, but also you know also appeal to sort of like natural language um, work as well, because that's really where you're going to get sort of the, these full rich meanings. Of what these verbs mean. So looking at them in natural speech, how are they, like you said, how are they used, not only just in dialects, but also like in the natural, in their natural occurrences. I think that that's, I think that that's really good advice. And I think, uh, and I think it's well taken. And I see a hand from Roland Kiesling. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, great work. Uh, I appreciate this a lot. And uh, I have, um, one uh, observation and maybe uh, a question and um, um, some details, but uh, this is might not be that important. But is it correct, uh, the perception um, that um, in all Bantu 
uh, languages um, which um, yeah, from which you drew data which are supposed to be um, kind of part of the um, the rift um, valley area there's a verbal auxiliary core in this uh, clitic cluster and um, which does not seem to be the case at all for all the southern Cushitic uh, clusters. Uh, would you subscribe to that perception uh, or is that a, an important observation that um, kind of it, it suggests that it's a secondary development from internal so, uh, resources in, in Bantu, but there's we, we can't find any um, yeah, prior stage for Southern Cushitic, um, which would attest to this. And also for the, um, the evidence of um, concerning Datoga, it seems as if um, you mentioned, Richard, you mentioned that there were parallels which support internal um, innovation from um, Southern Nilotic sources, um, verbal resources most of the time uh, and in one respect i'm well i'm curious about this item one that you mentioned that you you seem to be indicating that there's a southern nilotic cognate for the datoga uh ja or maybe for meaning want i don't remember this exactly but maybe you can clarify uh something along those lines well, yeah, I'll answer that question first then. Okay. Um, sorry, I, I don't think I made that very clear in the presentation. The, the, the cognate in Datoga for the future constructions in the other Southern Nilotic languages is gas, which means want. Yeah, so, it, and it's not used for the future in, in Datoga. So, no, I have not found a, a cognate construction for the Datoga future. That's what makes it still a little bit more complicated. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Which would be um, nice to have if it. I could to respond to this. <laughs> because I've been hunting for it. <laughs> <laughs> needles, needles in our in our Rift Valley haystacks, I think. Um, I. I really don't have too much to say about, about sort of the, this comment on the fact that in the Bantu uh, pre-verbal clitic clusters, it seems like it's very easy to resolve, or at least it's, it's relatively easy to resolve back to some sort of, re, re, um, some sort of lexical verb. And I think that's very true. Whereas with the, um, with the South Cushitic uh, uh, clitic clusters, it's very, very difficult to resolve back to a, a, a verbal core. Um, this is an interesting sort of question, and um, I think, I mean, sort of from my gut, I really believe if we hold a magnifying glass up to these pre-verbal clitic cl complexes in in, uh, in Cushitic, we can find something verbal. But I haven't done I haven't done the legwork and uh, and uh, and done the explanation enough, and that's almost worth a whole other talk, I think. But um, I think I think. That if we that if we hang on for a little bit, I think that we can probably find verbal origins or at least very verbal sort of patterns. We can find similarities between what's going on with the lexical verbs and similarities with what's going on with the um, with these uh, verbal or with these auxiliaries uh, in South Cushitic. But that's uh, I think that that's a fight for another day. Of course, these uh, verbs tend to reduced to zero, of course. <laughs> it, it doesn't help if the uh, needle in your haystack just disappears completely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I see if Marta's raised his hands. Yes, I have raised my hand and um, yeah, I was thinking all the time what I'm going to say and I'm certainly not going to defend, uh, not Roland to do that, the, K, the KMN. Um, so I'm happy with the, the but, but you, you, you knew that from my earlier presentations, I'm, I'm happy to not to uh, reduce the similarity uh, of all these uh, pre-verbal critics simply to, uh, you know, this is a language area. 
Um, uh, on the last point, though, uh, I noticed Ox has gloss all the time, and and now Andrew, you you set yourself the goal to find the verbal origins of these oxes. Um, I have the impression that that the, the ox is used in two different ways. It's 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 used as a syntactic thing, uh, where um, you know, let's say what. But at some point was uh, was infill, uh, and and it doesn't need to have come historically from a verb and uh, from an independent verb, uh, and I think it's uh, it's interesting that what we see in in a lot of the, a lot of languages in the world, including here in Europe, that you see all sorts of uh, constructions with. Uh, uh, yeah, inflection on two different places in the clause, and and one of them, um, yeah, we can we can call ox because we know where they uh, where the base comes from, and and this is uh, and I would make the difference with these constructions that we have in this case, uh, not only here, uh, I think it's a bit similar in Iran and in Australia, where the is there is an, an empty or a, a copula kind of core to the thing and um, i think they are just simply uh, yeah you get confused by by the gloss ox to then think okay it's the, the kind of ox that 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 wants an or original verb but i think that um, still i'm very intrigued uh, with this uh, some of these analyses and and uh, um of uh, for example the datoga the, to to get i think that that is the step forward to get to the nitty-gritty developments and what happens what happened actually in datoga and and you know i i but roland knows more about this so what happened in in within within west rift and 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 you see the g affirmative uh, there and there's the g in the iraqu cluster so uh, without claiming that the um, uh, selectors are, are borrowed, because I find it very nicely uh, formulated by you in the conclusions, like what would it actually mean to borrow the selector? I, I, I can't imagine anything in, in, in that. But what I can imagine is that, uh, that there is this uh, yeah, pressure from known other languages uh, where, where the structures but and also sometimes forms are similar i mean the equi i i didn't know i was for me that's absolutely an eye-opener uh whether it comes from stand i agree with bonnie that's not so clear but the 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 correlation with naturo and hadza is is is, is too close to uh, and 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 it's such a long form so it can't be simply chance there has to be something there so i think our steps forward would be for all these cases to have fine-grained uh, scenarios of what actually happened, and I would be very happy if 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 the the influence of contact is 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 marginal and only you know um, supplying support for certain constructions or certain materials to be um, preferred in 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 the choice of the development rather than simply uh, taken uh, taken over. But for the for the uh, Naturo, Nianzu, uh, uh, Yambi, uh, Nilamba, um, yeah, we would like to have an internal uh, a reconstruction of those, and then and then see uh, what happened in all all of these four languages. And, yeah. To respond to you, Martin, though this equiform and Hadza if it had came from these particular Bantu languages, so, I mean, these Bantu languages were, uh, you know, Ihanzu has been in recent contact with Hadza, but how how recent was this development in these other, I mean, the, I'm not sure the timeline works out for this to have been borrowed into Hadza from these languages that may have grammaticalized it relatively recently. I don't know. If yeah, and the other way around. I think it's very true, Bonnie, that, um, that looking at these forms as inherently bent to 
uh, may actually be, be, be doing it backwards. Maybe it is looking at, the, at this form as Hadza and then, and then you know, uh, fanning out. I think we'd need to look into the wider sort of, um, the wider distribution of this equi form. That might be, that might actually be a very um, easy sort of marker to look at. Um, well, I wouldn't that... discount chance either because grammatical right. morphemes tend to come from a smaller set of, of consonants than other morphemes. And... But, but equi is quite long and quite specific. Yeah. In contrast to all these R's. Eh, eh. All over Bantu, there's long R for past. What about future? Since I was uh, kind of nervous when you cited the, uh, when discussing the Nyaturu examples, you uh, were talking about the near future na, low toned na. And uh, I think the bottom line of your line of argument was to blame it on Burunge. Con uh, contact to Burungi, uh, where the low-toned R for near future uh, seems to be borrowed from Burungi, but uh, I don't think that this has a solid standing in Southern Cushitic, and I was rather, <laughs> uh, well, thinking uh, that it was the other way around, that it was borrowed from some Bantu source into Burungi. Um, but Martin, you know about, uh, well, I was, the, isn't there something in Alagua, which is also very confusing about R's uh, occurring in that context. And uh, sometimes they have past meaning and sometimes it's a future meaning, or I think you discuss it as ablative in, or there, there are various, uh, I don't know if it's polysemy or homophony, uh, homonymy, I mean, uh, sorry for, interfering no no yes i agree yeah it's uh, i yeah so i was also surprised uh, that you uh, that uh, certainly for the r past the, the I, I don't think i think that long r past is uh, i would say it is just too complex to and and too short or loads long <laughs> Um, but the future, in principle, because in so many in so many languages, that is innovation, isn't it? And grammaticalization. Uh, I think it's relatively new in Rangi uh, in 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 Iraq. Uh, it's the, the 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 verb to go is, is sort of you can you can use that. Uh, I wouldn't even know whether to call that grammaticalized already, but yeah. But uh, if it's really in the system in, in both Hatra and uh, Naturu, not as a, as a separate auxiliary construction, but in a yeah, really grammaticalized construction, These these uh, uh, Bantu languages they they do this all the time. Now they uh, uh, develop new new tenses uh, from uh, from auxiliary kind of constructions. I mean, uh, in the Usambaras, uh, Shambai is absolutely crazy. Uh, I think they have a they have a new tense every year or so. I mean. Uh, they throw in an adverb into in, into the slot uh, in in the verb and uh, and there's a new tense there. And that is maybe also something that that may happen that you once once you have these complex constructions that slots where things can happen. Then I mean Roland has that for a completely different thing. This this cradle uh, of uh, of innovation, mm. and I think certain slots. I think that is absolutely insightful that certain slots are attract innovation. Mm. What about Maasai? Does it have any share in this? 
this is this is where we need to uh, this is where we need to get Michael uh, in. Well, Michael is in the room, uh, but we need to we need to do some uh, we need to do some collaboration with Michael because I think that you know he would have his pulse on on what's going on in Maasai, not only in in the variety of Maasai at which he speaks uh, natively, but also the varieties of Maasai that he has worked on. You know, um, so so again, that's really interesting. I also see that Bonnie put a lot of uh, interesting sources into chat, so I'll make sure to send you that as well. So that's kind of you. Yeah, well, the qua has a lot of different meanings, as you'll see from the dictionary. It's an, also an if, when, where, auxiliary, you know, so, and with E possibly having, you know, some sort of state of kind of, I don't know. I'm just saying. There, chance is uh, greater than one often expects <laughs> there 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 is a lot of qua there is a lot of qua in Hadza. I know I know that I, I yeah for sure qua and vowel height harmony yeah so you know Well, I think kind of in summary what you're saying is that uh, the the history of the area is deeper and